Hello everyone, I'm Phyllis Coldeye coming to you from Brookings, South Dakota, and this is Staying Power, part of your virtual care package for the pandemic. This is a video version of the brief reflection with which I opened this week's package. If you're not yet a subscriber to Staying Power, I invite you to join. It's a free service. You'll receive an email every Sunday containing a bundle of resources to sustain you. To subscribe, just go to the link provided in the video description. As a child, did you have a special place where you liked to hang out alone? Maybe even a series of places over the course of your tender years? Places that in memory still bring a smile to your face or a twinkle to your eye? My first special place was my own bed, where instead of going to sleep when I was supposed to, I'd hide beneath my covers with a flashlight, reading books. I remember, too, the comfy nests that I excavated deep within the mountain of straw bales in the haymow. I shared those hidey holes with a passel of barn cats and books. Then there was the attic above Dad's shop. Once I climbed up there, I could retract the rickety wooden stairs with a rope and be alone with my books. And I mustn't forget the woods behind the farm pond. I especially liked the trash heap overgrown with brush that contained the remains of some stranger's long ago life, maybe even an ancestor's. Judging by the broken glass bottles I found, the refuse dated back generations. The junk set me off on flights of fancy. After all, every stranger needs a story. One of the last special places in my youth was south of our house on the grassy bank overlooking the Blanchard River. That river was scarcely more than a stream, but I liked to watch it tripping over the rocks, coming from somewhere, going elsewhere, taking my imagination with it. I mulled over the most complicated knots of my adolescence in that spot. Not all children can easily make or find their own special and secret places their own private and solitary spaces, yet most usually try. The instinct to do so seems part of the sacred alchemy by which we start to shape ourselves and our sense of the world apart from our parents. If we're discerning, our process of soul making doesn't end when we hit adulthood. Neither does our longing for a place of our own where we can just be. But as grown-ups, we struggle to carve out such places in our busy lives, visit them regularly, or fully relax when we're there. Every winter around this time, I say goodbye to my guys and go on a sequestered writing retreat for around 10 days. Usually, I head somewhere warmer and greener than South Dakota. This isn't a vacation. It's an escape from winter, a dose of milder weather and brighter sunshine to tide me over until spring. Because my work is portable and I love what I do, it goes along, too. This year, Due to the pandemic, I talked myself out of my winter retreat, unwilling to risk the travel. Yet, as the calendar pages turned, I began to regret my decision. I realized that my retreating has never been just about avoiding winter, or even about having the chance to ride up a storm without distraction. No, it has also been about encounter, about deliberately entering a quieter space in order to meet whatever 
I might meet there, within and beyond myself. Dropping the burden of schedules and obligations, I offer up my undivided attention. I give up my habit of being in charge. What happens then? Magic. Surprises popping up like day lilies, dreams mushrooming in the night, inspirations fluttering through on angel wings. Who was I kidding? I couldn't not go on retreat. I rented a teensy mother-in-law house 45 minutes down the highway. I'll be driving there soon. The forecast? snow showers with a high temperature of seven degrees. Retreat is a word rich with implication. We tend to think of it as a pulling back or withdrawal from an activity or a location such as an army from a battlefield or a glacier from a valley. But the old French word from which it derives also suggests leaving the extremities by drawing in. Leaving the extremities by drawing in. For those of us now sheltering in place, I wonder what would happen if we thought of our pandemic isolation as a pandemic retreat. True, we didn't choose it. And if we have housemates or work from home, it isn't entirely our own, but it's nevertheless ours. This situation that we're in can be a tremendous refuge for soul making if we embrace it and organize it to our benefit. Let me tell you about my friend, Julie. During the pandemic, she has fashioned a cup to hold the energy of her days. Not a strict schedule, but a loose structure formed by five intentional activities. Walking, practicing yoga, playing piano, singing, and painting. These aren't the only things she does by far, but these are her daily commitments. She retreats into these activities from the extremities, not because she feels pressured or obliged to, but because they sustain her. They strengthen her. They heighten her joy. Retreating doesn't require a dedication to certain pursuits like Julie's nor does it require a special place as in childhood or a set apart time like my midwinter getaway. Those details are optional. What retreating does require though is keeping faith with ourselves. What does it mean to keep faith with ourselves? First, we promise ourselves to withdraw from the extremities of life on a regular basis for the purpose of self-maintenance. Second, we promise ourselves not to let anything but an emergency stop us, not even a pandemic. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a suitcase to pack. Remember, folks, you're not alone. Deep peace and health to you. This has been Phyllis Coldeye on Staying Power.